The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So now we resume after our hiatus in the introductory theme uh, because of the snow day. We resume the introductory theme, right? And this is the second of three introductory lectures. And today we deal with uh, the modal characteristics in real. So we talk about the different modes of public transportation and their characteristics and, and what role they play. We're looking at the range of modes and services, the descriptions of each mode, and we'll do some comparisons in terms of how they perform. Okay, so what are the roles for each mode? When we think about the different modes that can be used for transportation, you can think in different dimensions. And one of them is going from low density to high density. That is from very sparse OD matrices where origins and destinations are both scattered in a geographical area to a situation where along a particular corridor there are concentrated origin destination pairs. And uh, many people wanting to travel along a corridor. Obviously this happens more in cities than it happens in rural areas. And we also see that we can think about it in that same dimension from having low vehicle capacity being necessary to requiring high vehicle capacity. And by capacity, I mean the capacity of a vehicle to hold passengers inside, right? So in that direction, we have private modes and, and on the top, and we have public modes, so-called public modes at the bottom. So we all know what the private auto is. That's, it's a private mode that is often used by a single person, sometimes by a family. Um, and yeah, so very low density, one OD pair being served. Uh, then you go to carpool where two people or more are in that same vehicle and there might be multiple stops along the way. And van pool, slightly larger vehicle. This is uh, often private, so it could be an arrangement uh, between coworkers uh, requiring capacity higher than a normal car, so they get a van and maybe one of them drives it or maybe they hire a driver. So then in the public side, we have taxi, and I'm using the term here generally, so you can think of this as one of the newer forms of taxi transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, so you might, you might hail a cab for just for yourself uh, and that's the extreme or you might use the pool servicing, uh, the pool services of offered by those companies or you might share a taxi so you start increasing the utilization of that vehicle. Then we have publicos. Publicos are, uh, they can be cars or vans. They're operated by uh, a, a private driver often uh, in an association and they usually drive these vehicles uh, along more semi-flexible, semi-fixed corridors. So people more or less know the routes they serve and they have some flexibility. So they can say, well, can you take me uh, you know, around the corner and, and they'll do that. So uh, it's, it's the mode that is sort of right before formalized public transportation. Then we have fixed route bus, so that's the route one and, and the buses here in Boston and in many places, traditional bus service. BRT, which is bus rapid transit, which is a, a mode where buses are being used to deliver transit that is generally delivered via rail services, light rail services in particular. We'll look at some examples later in this lecture. And then we have light rail, like the Boston, Boston's Green Line, and heavy rail, which is the traditional subway or metro system, right? In the middle, sometimes subscription bus. So these are services that are sometimes, uh, it's often uh, uh, like a no normal sized bus. It'd be paid for by a company to get its employees to the site, right? So it's somewhere in the middle because it's not public. It's not, not everybody can use it but it's not private because uh, somebody else, there's a third party who is providing the service. Okay, so along that same direction of increasing vehicle capacity and passenger flows, we can also look at 
what happens to the operating arrangements. And we have three operating arrangements listed here, three classes. What happens to drivers? What happens to right of way? What happens to routing and scheduling? So how much does it cost to, to have drivers operating a private car? If it's just you, you don't think about the cost, although you could assume some cost for your value of time, but you're not paying someone to drive you often. Um, as you move to van, as I said earlier, if it's an arrangement where you or one of your friends is the one driving the van, that's free as well. Or if you hire a driver, then it becomes a low cost uh, uh, salary or payment for that driving service. Then we have minibus and bus. So depending on the size of the system and how big vehicles are and the context of, of how that driver gets hired, it could be low, low cost. But as you move to traditional transit and uh, labor uh, unions, then the cost starts increasing, right? So, so you have higher salaries, um, and especially as you move towards light rail and heavy rail, much higher salaries for drivers. However, when we get to heavy rail, especially the more modern, the most advanced systems of heavy rail, a lot of these are driverless. They operate automatically. And they might have attendance inside of them, but they don't necessarily need to have drivers. So you could think in the extreme, this coming back down to, well, it's a robot driving the vehicle, and I don't have to pay for a driver. In terms of right of way, uh, we start with shared right-of-way, so cars, vans, minibuses, and buses typically share the road with other cars, right? So they're sharing the space and they're stuck in traffic if, if, if there is traffic. For bus, light rail, you have a mix. Uh, some, some of these systems can operate only in a shared right-of-way or only in dedicated corridors or a mix of both. So light rail systems, for example, often have shared, often have dedicated right of ways, but when they hit intersections, they have to wait like all the other cars uh, to cross the intersection. Not always, but often. And then there's dedicated right of ways, which is more typical for metro systems, where it's a tunnel, um, or it's at grade, or it's a, uh, an over, yeah, like a elevated section, um, but it's dedicated to this metro system. So, you have a question, Nathan? Yeah. yeah um, about light rail. What would you call a light rail on certain segments that it's, that has its own complete right away and it's grade separated? Because they have that you know these mixed systems where they're partially light rail and they're partially segregated. And you even have heavy rail that even has occasional crossings. That's right. It's yeah. Kind of yeah. A little bit blurry to get that, absolutely. And that, that's a great question. So the question is uh, why or wh how do we label uh, some of some services that share? Uh, characteristics that I'm describing. I'm saying metro is this way and light rail is this way, but there are in fact systems that combine some of these characteristics. So I'm talking about the stereotypical descriptions of each system, and one of the points of this lecture is in fact that um, it's blurry. All these lines are blurry, and you can combine different characteristics. So yeah, but it's, it's still useful t as a framework to think about all the different modes and their typical or stereotypical characteristics. Right, so routing and scheduling. So if you're in your own car, fully flexible, right? You decide where the car is, when it leaves, when it ends uh, its trip. Uh, as you move towards minibus and you're sharing the ride with other people, you might have either fixed routes or fully flexible or somewhere in between, like the publicos. Uh, that I described, where there is a semi-fixed route, but with some flexibility to deviate from those to accommodate certain passengers' destinations. And then as we move to the most formal systems, it's a fixed route. It's a published service plan that uh, with stops at, at certain places, and people know where to go take it. Any questions on the spectrum of services? Yeah, another one. Ethan, yes? Uh, yes. Yes. You would, you would have to know where to board. That's right. But they, would, they could drop you off, right? Uh, yes. Sometimes you can call the, the companies, and they can communicate and say, arrange for a pickup. But most typically, yeah, that you, you have more flexibility on the alighting side. All right. Other categories. Let's talk about rights of way. We started talking about that. So degree segregation. We can think about three different levels. Uh, surface with mixed traffic. This is typical for buses or light that has no preferential treatment. 
Um, then we go to longitudinal separation with at grade crossing. The green line here in Boston is mostly like that. Um, it, several branches are like that. So they run on their own track. When they hit an intersection, they have to wait for the red light uh, with other cars. Uh, some sections of the green line are actually uh, surface with mixed traffic. I'm thinking about the last end of the E line. Uh, and then full separation, right? So that could be at grade tunnel elevated. Technologies, let's talk about technologies. Uh, support, which is referring to contact between the vehicle and the surface, what counters the force of gravity essentially for these vehicles. We have rubber tire on concrete. Uh, for buses, that's typically what it is. Uh, some trains have that. If you go to the metro system in, in Paris, for example, you'll see a uh, rubber tire on concrete for their metro. Um, that is, it has a benefit over steel wheel on steel rail in terms of the grip and therefore acceleration and braking distances. They can be shorter. Steel wheel and steel rail is more common for rail systems and uh, the main cost is lower. They're, they last longer, um, but they have a lower uh, coefficient of uh, friction, so uh, braking distances are longer, and the capacity to uh, climb very steep grades is reduced. You have a question? Yeah, do you think Paris knows that because they're stopped? Do you care what the braking is doing for you? I don't know. Many, yeah, I don't know why they chose that. I have an answer yeah. Uh, uh, Michelin, the company, when they were rebuilding their, their metro after World War II, put a lot of pressure on them to move to highway. That sounds more likely. <laughs> <laughs> not not a conspiracy, but uh, yeah, the local industry uh, being favored in the construction of a system uh, that makes a lot of sense, right? So I'll buy that. Uh, right. So other support systems. Let's get some ideas. Besides these very traditional rubber on concrete or rubber on asphalt, steel wheel on steel rail, what other sub forms of support exist? Some of them are fancy, some of them are less common. Let's start over here with magnetic levitation. So maglev, right? Uh, you can think about the, some of the Japanese systems uh, that do that. Um, for a very high speed rail, you want to reduce friction, so you use magnetic levitation to reduce friction. Over here? Uh, no contact, like hyperloop? Uh, yeah, well, not a, not a real system yet. <laughs> it can't take turns, but, uh, but yeah, so air, it's some other form of levitation, right? Well, based on air pressure and yeah. Any other ideas? Small airplanes are actually a trick. Yeah, <laughs> we're not, so in this course, that, that is right, it's a form of public transportation. In this course, we are excluding some forms of uh, a public transit. Uh, we're excluding airplanes. You could argue that elevators are a form of public transportation. <laughs> Um, they go up and down along a track, and you have stops that you call, uh, <laughs> but we're also excluding them. Uh, so, yes, uh, I'm thinking more more traditionally, but uh, somewhat different forms of support. Um, cable cars? Cable cars, yes, or, or gondolas, right? Uh, so suspended cabs that are taken uh, over the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, there's funiculars, which are very and are sort of, they look like a little rail car, but they climb very steep grades. Yes. Ferries. Ferries. Uh, so if you go to TransLink in Vancouver, ferries are part of their transit system. Yeah. So, okay. I think that covers some ideas. Let's talk about guidance now. And when I say guidance, I mean lateral control. What steers the vehicle? So, Traditionally, steered by the driver, right? So that's for bus. Uh, for rail, obviously, the vehicle is guided by the track. And then there are other forms of steering. Any, any ideas of what they could be? Emily? Uh, I mean, this is also sort of a little bit, I mean, a little bit into the future, but self-driving vehicles? Yes, so you have a robot with a servo that's steering the thing. Yeah, and we have an example. Uh, in this lecture of uh, real systems that already do that, yeah. There's a, in, in Britain there are like buses on gas That's right, we have a picture of that. So great. All right, great. So uh, yeah, examples of that. Now let's talk about energy and propulsion. So for bus, the most traditional thing is to have a diesel internal combustion engine. Uh, 
it used to be the conventional engine. Now they've really improved with fuel injection and uh, other technologies. They've made them clean diesel so that they control the exhaust. And these engines can shut down and start very quickly without waste of uh, fuel. So um, they reduce pollution and noise. Uh, there's compressed natural gas, an abbreviated CNG. The, a lot of the fleet here in Boston, bus fleet, is CNG. And they're pretty loud, and they have a CNG logo in the back. So you'll notice when you see them, those are, they require special maintenance and refueling facilities, of course. And at least in North America, CNG was popular for a while, but now agencies are switching back to diesel, and in particular, clean diesel and hybrid electric with diesel. So fully electric buses exist, and they're getting better. Battery energy storage is getting better. So we have fully electric buses that can service that can provide service for many hours uh, without recharge in between, so that's great. And as I mentioned, hybrid diesel electric, that's very common. I think it's being the preferred bus mode now. So uh, preferred energy system or propulsion system for buses. So often what, how this works is that you have a diesel, clean diesel engine that powers an electric generator, uh, which stores electric energy, and then on each wheel you have electric motors. Um, so in fact, the propulsion directly is electric, and you're only using the, the motor to generate electricity. So um, you can get a lot of fuel efficiency from that, especially because of these buses stop so often, right? They have very, a lot of stop and go, and, and um, so sometimes you can just kill the engine when the bus is stopped. All right, uh, what about control? So we talked about guidance, which is lateral control. What about longitudinal control? So how do you control um, when you stop? how you accelerate, how quickly you, you go or brake. So we have manual or visual. So buses are typically driven by a person who has a brake and an accelerator and they control everything manually uh, and on site. There's also manual uh, with signals. This more typically for rail, you have signals that might set a limit, a speed limit on the vehicle and protect the trains from crashing into each other. And then there's fully automatic. So you have a robot controlling the longitudinal movement of the vehicle. Questions on these technologies? We'll see some examples. Eitan. In terms of automatic control, there's already automatic control as well. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about uh, automatic train protection. Uh, here's how it works. This is the classical block system for rails. Um, and here's how we control the longitudinal movement in a, in a system like the red line. So this is the fixed block system. What you do is that you divide the track into sections. And the goal of the system is to prevent trains from colliding to each other. So let's suppose that there's a train right here in, in Maroon and it's occupying a section of track. The track knows that a train is occupying that segment, and it, to prevent a collision, it uh, blocks trains from entering the previous segment, okay? And how does it do that? It does that by setting the speed limit on the segment two, two segments upstream to zero. So if a train were to enter that, that segment, it would be braked automatically. And then the speed limit gets increased as you go farther upstream. So a train can move uh, along the track, but if it gets too close or uh, to, a, to the piece of track being occupied, it'll have to slow down or brake. Have you been on a train here or elsewhere where you're braked all of a sudden in the middle of, of the track between stations? Yeah, and then normally you hear the, the brakes going off and then the, it starts again. So what happens in those cases is that the driver exceeded the speed limit and the automatic train protection system kicked in, it, breaks, it brings the train to a halt, and the driver won't be able to start the train again until the, the pressure on the brake system is released. Questions? Since the DC Metro does not have this, I used to never ride in the front of the back car because they were notorious for like hitting each other. <laughs> At least like 10 years ago. Yeah, they have that, so if it's, it, they, they have a system uh, to prevent collisions. Uh, if it, things, if it's not uh, maintained properly, then things can happen. 
or it could be that they hadn't enabled it in some sections of the track. I don't know the details. Because there were a lot of people that died. Like yeah. So. All right. So one of the things with block with block systems like this is that they constrain the capacity of the line. If we look at the red line in particular, this is the the line that, that puts a constraint on on uh, how the frequency of service. Um, minutes. You can't run service more often than that on the red line because of this, uh, the way the blocks were designed. So what happens? As you're moving from Kendall to Charles MGH, uh, in, and particularly in the segment from MGH to Park, this segment right here is downhill, right? You're going from elevated downhill to, to uh, subway. So you're all going downhill on steel wheel and steel rail. The track might be wet because it was outside. So there's a concern that the braking distance might be quite long. And to be very safe and conservative, what happens is that trains are not allowed to enter Park Street until the train ahead departs Downtown Crossing. So you need to clear the platform of Downtown Crossing and only then can you start moving into Park Street. Um, so that might cause trains to be held up at Charles, actually. Um, so yeah, so if we look at the, the time that it takes the, the train to close in, that is from the beginning uh, when the head of the train hits the circuit um, just after Charles MDH um, to the time it actually gets to Park Street and opens its doors, the dwell time at Park Street serving passengers, uh, allowing passengers to get off and to board, and then you have the running time between Park Street and Downtown Crossing. Um, and finally, the time it requires the train to close its doors and, exit and, and for the tail of the train to clear the circuit so that it's no longer occupying the circuit. That's about three minutes. You can't run service more often than that. So uh, you would have to change the blocking design of, of, of this segment of the red line if you wanted to increase the frequency. Um, more modern systems are communications-based uh, train control systems. And what happens in those cases is that the blocks are not fixed. They move between vehicles. A computer will look at the speeds and the distances between trains and generate virtual blocks that are quite short. Uh, and they can control with a finer precision how the speed limits uh, that a train uh, has being applied for safety. Often, these are in systems that are automatically controlled. So you have the moving block system, which increases the capacity. And you have a computer also regulating the speed, which eliminates driver variability and further increases the capacity of the system. Any questions on blocking? What, what are some examples of systems we've done the most modern? I'll give some examples on the next slide, actually. So a great segue. So levels of automated protection. So we start with basic. Uh, the green line has no protection, right? So, and that's why a few years ago somebody was, uh, well, they, they said the person was texting, but then they said there was a medical problem. I'm not sure. Um, so, so uh, yeah. So a train rear-ended another one. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, I don't think anybody was killed. Um, but yeah, so. There are advisory signals uh, along the track that say you should go or you should uh, not go or you should go slowly. Um, but it's up to the driver to, to regulate that speed. Ari? On the green line, one of the provisions of the white side signal is that it's old is that, that if you get your red signal and you and it does not change anything, if you wait 60, se 60 seconds, you can proceed through Right. Oh, and you have to proceed slowly. Yeah, but yeah. Proceed. Right. So they allow trains to sometimes to both two, two trains to berth at a platform in some cases, although they're not really liking that anymore, but they used to do it more. Right, so. In Chicago, they'll let trains pull. You can call to get clearance to pull past the red signal and pull that last train. That's true for most systems. You can override, and with a very slow speed, you can uh, make take control and manually. And you need that because sometimes these systems fail, and they all go red. So you still have to move the trains, and you, you need this override system. But it'll, yeah, it won't it will allow quick movement. And that's how you have to run away train the red line. <laughs> yep. OK, the next level of automation is manually setting the speed below the maximum level. That's the red line, what I just described. In-cab signals 
the speed limit of the block that the train is occupying is sent to the cab so that the driver knows what the speed limit is. It's up to the driver to determine what the speed is, but if the driver exceeds that speed, the automatic train protection system kicks in and breaks the train to a halt. All right, uh, then we have manual setting of dwell times only. So the train drives itself between stations. The driver decides uh, on the door opening and door closing manually and therefore controls how long the doors are open for. So it's a more advanced system from the 70s um, and 80s. And then we have uh, semi-automated, so we have uh, automatic train supervision or automatic train regulation. A good example of this is Tren Urbano in San Juan, Puerto Rico um, and the London Underground Central Line. So here the train can drive itself automatically between stations uh, the driver only pushes a button to tell the train go to the next station, essentially. Um, in Tren Urbano's case, and I imagine this is true in all, in all systems, drivers are required to manually operate for a small fraction of their and to manually control trains if there is a failure of the system. Eli? But they don't control dwell times in these? Um, they can, but often not. Often the, the dwell times are also regulated. They, they, they definitely control them, like on the, cent on the central line. Yeah, so, you, yeah. On so, so you, you have this button that you push the driver to sort of authorize the movement forward. So you can, right, you can uh, not press it and thereby extend the dwell time. Uh, but the speed between the, the stations and everything else is, is the parking of the train at the platform and the opening of the doors all happens automatically. Uh, then you have full automation, and this comes often with a communications-based train control. Um, so you could drive this without any driver inside. Um, sh uh, airport trains uh, are often like this, but we're seeing this in metro systems as well. Some, in some systems, the, uh, they still have attendants or they still have a driver uh, just in case or for political reasons. Um, but these systems can drive themselves. Um, you often need platform screen doors. Well, that's one of the concerns with auto fully automatic systems. Um, people to go into the track and the computer won't see them, right? So it has to be a more controlled uh, system. Uh, line 14 in, in Paris is another example of that. Uh, yeah, and then you can add increased capacity through a moving block system. And here's an example of the Commercy line in New York City. Uh -huh. Question. You said um, there were trains, like the people movers and Yeah, so th these systems have platform screen doors and they don't have a driver, right? So you go in and, and they move between stations. But you also have lots of metro systems in cities that work like that. As of 2013, there were 48 automated, automatic, fully automated metro lines in 32 cities over the world um, that didn't require a driver to operate, and that number is going up. Okay, let's talk about bus. What is a bus? And we're talking about the stereotypical, this is the what is a bus, what is a train lecture. So, uh, so we're, this is the stereotypical description of what a bus is, but of course the, the boundary and uh, the boundaries between these modes are blurry. So the stereotypical description is a vehicle operating individually with rubber tires with manual lateral and manual longitudinal control. So a driver has full control. Uh, sizes, they can be small, like a minibus can carry 10 to 20 passengers and you could go up to bi-articulated, carrying as much as a, a light rail system, a light rail train. So up to 250 passengers if you look at systems like Curitiba in Brazil. Um, vehicle design, you can have high floor design or low floor design. Can somebody suggest what the difference is and what the benefit of low floor is? Eli. Low floor is better for wheelchair accessibility. Uh-huh, there's another benefit. So one of the benefits of low floor is wheelchair accessibility. Another benefit. Sorry? Shorter dwell times, right? Because people are not climbing stairs to get on the vehicle or off the vehicle, you can speed up the process and increase capacity. Another idea? Uh, Sorry? Um, I'm not sure that's the case. I don't think that has a, a large impact on, on um, yeah, on 
I don't think vehicle design in terms of high floor or low floor increases stability that much. Not anyway for the for the speeds at which these buses go. It's not m much of a critical consideration. Okay, right of way. So all options are available. You could be on the street sharing your lane with cars, or you could have a dedicated bus lane with uh, no signals and preferential treatment if you have if you have some signals. So everything goes. In terms of guidance, often it is manual, but sometimes you have the systems to automatically guide the bus. And we'll see two examples of that later in this lecture. Propulsion, all options are available. You have electric, you have diesel, you have hybrid, everything. Um, and in terms of fare payments, another key decision, if you're thinking of a new bus system uh, in your city, is do you have the people paying the fare as they get on the vehicle, or do you want that to do you want that payment to happen outside? So are you going to make some stations where people pay their fare and then board without having to interact with the fare box? The benefit of the latter is that you speed up the dwell times, but of course you need to spend more on uh, fare gates or some other means of paying a fare. Is there, is there a benefit to high floor urban buses? They're not, not intercity coaches. So I, they're cheaper uh, because it's easier. You have more space to right to put all the uh, mechanical parts of the bus. Um, and I'll, I'll actually show you in some BRT systems like Curitiba's, it is very high floor, yeah, yeah. and that's very high capacity. So uh, yeah. So. This is a bus. Um, this is uh, this is a uh, traditional 40-foot bus that seats 39 people. It has capacity for 56 people if you count standees. You can crush a few more people in. Um, here's a double deck, uh, capacity for 70 to 80 people. The upper deck is for sitting only. If they see you, the driver will announce that you have to sit down for safety. Um, so, uh, articulated bus in Bogota. So now you're getting a, a bigger size. You have two sections, much like the light rail, you get the green line vehicle here in Boston, but this is a bus, and bi-articulated. So you can keep adding sections. Um, this is the example that I mentioned, where it's a high floor bus. Uh, notice how high the doors are, and obviously no one's gonna jump from, <laughs> from the street up or down. Uh, these are at specific stations, and here's the photo. These are the stations. You can see that there are gates. So people have to enter the stations and pay their fare as they go in. And sorry. Um, and then there are these uh, little platforms that stick out. The bus stops right in front of those, and the doors open wide, much like a metro door would open very quickly to allow level boarding. Um, so this is a, a of BRT, Bus Rapid Transit, with all the features of Bus Rapid Transit. Uh, so you have links for fare collection, you have very wide doors. Um, so it behaves like a rail system, but it's it's buses that are uh, serving it. Uh, were there some questions? I saw some hands. Perhaps I answered them. Okay. Um, now a minibus, a very small minibus. Uh, so if there were a cute bus, perhaps this is it, right? Um, so this is an Amion in, uh, in France. Uh, it says uh, free service, one bus every six minutes from 7.30 to 7.30, from Monday to Saturday. Uh, so this probably sits 10 people about. So uh, Here's uh, the Cambridgeshire busway in the UK. This is automatically guided. So the bus has a, a mechanical arm that sticks in front of the wheels or behind the wheels uh, with a curb and it, it sort of holds uh, laterally against the, these edges of concrete. And so if that guide weight turns, the steering wheel will also turn. Does that make sense? The benefit of this is that you can run uh, quick, you can sort of, uh, yeah, operate at high speed through narrow sections. This is more useful in tunnels. So this, for example, the silver line here in Boston could operate much faster if it had that system to guide it. Um, Okay, here's another system for guidance. Can somebody tell me how this works? 
It goes back to what Emily said earlier. What, do you notice these lines on the floor? So there's a camera looking down right in front. And it's, uh, it, this camera is programmed to automatically steer the bus such that it remains uh, along that line. Um, so the lateral control of that bus in, in, uh, France, in France, um, it's is fully automatic. Eli? What's the advantage of this? Like, is it actually dedicated? It, you can, so this is a pretty narrow section going both ways. So you can fast, uh, it's, uh, computers are better at controlling things, uh, so. Uh, and I, we could highlight other features like this uh, sign here saying, you know, when the buses are coming. And so this is a nicer bus system um, with elements of BRT. That's another comment I want to make of BRT. BRT is, uh, uh, the full BRT is much like the Curitiba example I showed you, but especially in North America and actually all over the world, uh, agencies are taking elements of BRT and applying um, somewhat selectively. Sometimes they call it BRT, um, even, so they take the branding of BRT into it. Um, hopefully it's more than just the branding and they've taken other components. Uh, Allah? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I imagine <laughs> you have to clean the and, and repaint the lines often, uh, or you have to take control, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about light rail. So, stereotypical description of light rail. Vehicles operating individually or in short trains with electric motors and overhead power collectors. Steel wheel and steel rail with manual or automatic seasonal control. So, if you were a consultant and you were thinking about, thinking about what how you were deciding on the key aspects of a new system. Uh, you could think about vehicle design. Are you going to make it high floor or low floor? So some vehicles here in the green line are, we have both in the green line. I don't know if you've noticed. The older ones are high floor. You have to go upstairs to enter the vehicle. And the more, the newer ones are, are low floor. Uh, you could have articulated or rigid body uh, vehicles. Um, right of way, you have all options just for bus. And you also have uh, fully automated to manually driven or things in between. And here are some examples. We have, this is in Utah, the Trax TRAX. Um, and this one goes through, I believe this is an intersection where cars can cross. Um, so it's uh, sharing some aspects of its right of way. Here's uh, the Metro Blue Line in Minneapolis. Um, both of these take power electrically from overhead catenaries, as you see here. And, but the third, well, no, not the third. Here we also have catenaries, that's the green line. Um, here is a, the fourth example I have of light rail is, has no catenaries. So this is a, a more modern system for powering light rail that actually stereotypical description. So does somebody know how this works? Ground. Yeah. It has, you can see like three lines. There are three lines. So these two are for guidance yeah. and there's one in the middle. The other one is the That's the third rail. So how do you prevent people from electrocuting themselves when they walk? Because typically in metro systems, the third, it's unless, yeah. Huh? Uh, in induction? Uh, no, it's contact. Nope, it has to. It has to be. Yeah. Harry. It's in short insulated sections that are only active when the vehicle is rolling. And they're electronically controlled. So, so the the head and the tail of the train emits some signals that say, "I'm over you." Open, like turn turn the section on, and only the section that is under the vehicle is powered. Uh, the rest of it is disconnected. So it's prettier because you don't have these overhead catenaries that are somewhat unsightly taking space. Over in the back. Sorry? This is in Bordeaux in France. Oh. Is it also cheaper because it's... 
the ground rather than uh, I don't. I can imagine that it's more expensive, actually, uh, but I can't say for sure. Uh, it's getting, you know, when this started, it was a new thing, and, and there were issues with eaves and other things. Um, it's getting more widespread. I think they've solved a lot of the. It's becoming more common, so I imagine that the cost will go down with that. Back in the 50s, when we were in New York and DC, wouldn't allow overheads. They actually had clouds that they would that they had conduits in the ground. They had, had oh. underground. Yeah, underground. Yeah. All right. Stereotypical description of heavy rail. Vehicles operating in trains with electric motors on a fully separated right of way with manual signal or automatic longitudinal control, level boarding, and off vehicle fare payment. So metro, right? Well, if you were designing a metro system, what, were, what would be your key decisions? You would think about train length. How long will my train be? It can't be longer than your platform. So that your station design has to go with this. If you have old stations and you're having a capacity problem, you can't just buy longer trains. Some systems allow for the last car to remain, at least the last door of the last car to remain in the tunnel. Um, in London, you see that. Um, so we'll your station saying, if you're in the rear of the car, the front, uh, because we're entering a shorter, uh, a shorter segment. So that's one of them. The other things that could limit the length are turning radiuses at radii, but that's not usually a, a problem with metro because metro doesn't usually have very tight curves. Uh, okay, right of way. So you could have it at grade. If you have it at grade, that means that if you want cars to cross under or over, you have to do a tunnel or a, an overpass. Um, elevated, is you were making the overpass kind of over a long stretch for, for the train and allowing, uh, keeping your streets as they are. Um, and uh, tunnel, well, the Tren Urbano in Puerto Rico has all three types of, of, um, of, of right of ways. Station spacing is another consideration. If you space stations out, if you have longer distance stations, that means you can cover a longer distance faster. Um, but that means that people have to walk longer uh, to their final origin or their, uh, sorry, their, their, their first, their real origin or their real destination um, at, their, at both ends of the trip. Um, and then operating arrangements. We talked about the different blocking systems and control systems. Do you want this to be driven by a human or will a computer be taking over? So questions about this? Yeah. So the difference between heavy and light rail, is it as simple as just heavy and light rail? Or does no, it has nothing to do with whether with the weight uh, of the vehicle, for sure. Um, so, um, but again, in stereotypes. Well, not of the vehicle, but of the, of, of the type. Yeah, no. But, but stereotypically, yes, because you have street cars, which are, you know, the track is kind of embedded on the uh, narrower, uh, kind of on the ground. And then these heavy rail systems tend to have a third rail and sort of wider gauge for higher capacity. So here's an example. Uh, this is, uh, is this Beijing or Shanghai? Yeah. Yeah, Beijing, line four in Beijing. Uh, and you can see here so platform screen doors. So these will only open when a train is there and it protects people from being pushed into the, the track, which could happen by accident or a person trying to commit suicide, which is actually a big problem in, for metro operators. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the case of North, you mentioned, uh, do they control the, the door of the last car separately? So yes. They don't open the door that, that is not, yeah. <laughs> Only open doors that are right in front of a platform screen door, if that makes sense. And and it's hard to align the train very well, so you often have these with a computer controlling the train to stop precisely where the doors are. Do you know the system of uh, how how they how they choose the doors? Which door will be open? It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just based on the train will stop so that its first door aligns with the first platform screen door and everything else just follows. The control system. Huh? I think you use the control system. Like, what, 
communication happens exactly. Um, I don't know the details of each system I build. Yeah. This is Trangulano in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is an elevated section. You see the third rail right here, uh, carrying the power. Power, let's have a quick aside and talk about power. Um, the, there are two electric uh, sort of categories of, of way of thing. The rail is mostly 750 volt direct current power. Um, and systems that are longer alternating current at 25 kilovolt, so much higher voltage. Um, any ideas about the trade-offs between these two, or when would you use one over the other? Third rail at lower speeds? Uh, maybe, but more than lower speeds, it's shorter distances. So why? Yeah. So if you're yeah, so if you're in a tunnel, the tunnel construction will be more expensive if you have to fit in uh, a, a catenary and space for the pickup, right? Um, what else, Ari? And that is power. that is the key re difference, yeah. So power is a lot easier to transfer right. to maintain the system, right? Okay, so, so AC power, um, you, can tr you can change the voltage and the current, right? So you can make it very high voltage, and that means that it's easy and, and, and cheaper to transmit over longer distances. So whenever you have intercity trains, almost always they will be um, overhead uh, high voltage AC. Uh, for subways, uh, shorter distances, tunnels, you don't want to have transformers uh, everywhere. Um, and the other problem with high voltage is that the, it arcs more easily between two pieces of metal. So in a subway, system, in a subway train uh, like this, you don't have much space between uh, underneath the, the train to fit things in with proper electrical isolation. So if it's an intercity train, it's higher floor, uh, it, you have more space. Um, but if it's a metro system, often you have less space. So if it's DC, inside the train and, um, and you don't need transformers um, spaced out uh, at very short intervals in your system. Yeah, so that was a short parenthesis. Commuter rail is another kind of rail system. So the stereotypical description, vehicles operating in trains with long station spacing frequently, serving long trips into the central city. There's usually a large balance between peak hour and uh, off-peak service. So commuter rail to bring people into work in the morning and out of work uh, you know, in the afternoon. So you often have service every hour or every two hours uh, in the middle of the day. It's not designed for frequent service. Your key decision, the decisions are fare collection strategies. Are you gonna put gates on the whole system as if it were a metro system? Are you gonna have paper tickets? Um, some Systems are moving towards mobile phone ticketing, where you buy something that flashes in colors uh, and proves that you've bought a valid pass. Um, so different strategies for fair collection. Uh, line length, how long, how far out uh, from the city center are you gonna lay track and, and provide service? Are you gonna through route in the CBD? That is, is the train gonna only get to the CBD and turn back? Or are you gonna cross the city and and provide service on the other side, having crossed the tunnel. That's pretty critical, actually, because it's, commuter rail is very directional. So if you don't have a place near the city to store your trains after you have inbound service, you'd have to then take them out. Uh, so you're running trips that cost you money to operate, and we're not serving many trips. So if you have through routing and you have a yard uh, close to the city center, um, it, it might make more sense. Station spacing is another issue and extent of parking capacity. Why parking? Because commuter rail is often accessed uh, with a 
you know, and with a park and ride service, right? So you're usually, you, you drive to a commuter rail station, you park there, and then you take the commuter rail. Questions on commuter rail? Okay, some examples. This is diesel. So in some sections it runs on diesel. Uh, as it gets closer uh, to the city center, it uses electric power. Here's uh, Mumbai. And it, this one has a catenary. So it's taking power from, from these catenaries. This is Go Transit in Toronto. This is typical of commuter rail, uh, having two levels, two, two decks, to fit more people in. So what are the traditional service concepts? Bus on shared right-of-way, streetcar or light, that's a light rail on shared right-of-way, heavy rail on exclusive right-of-way, and then commuter or regional rail on something that is semi-exclusive or, or exclusive right-of-way. Sometimes commuter rail shares the, ra the segments with freight. Uh, so, and that's why it's semi-exclusive. Newer service concepts, BRT. So looking at using buses to operate something that is more akin to light rail or even to um, lighter heavy rail if you want. Um, so including exclusive lanes and or transit signal priority where the signals turn green uh, when a, one of these vehicles approaches to not delay the vehicle. At uh, and then light rail on exclusive right of way which makes more like heavy rail, if you look at the stereotypical descriptions that we had here. Okay, and what else is happening? Increasing diversity. Driver arrangements, um, instead of having people um, hiring part-timers to cover the peaks, or having 10-hour days, but not five days a week. Um, and then payment by vehicle type, so pay as much for uh, uh, an operator of a heavy rail car as you would for a bus. So let's go back to part-timers and 10-hour days. Why are these important to help increase the efficiency, operating efficiency of a bus or a rail system? Why is that necessary? Well, as people that just work in peak period where you need more, you're operating more of your fleet, but you don't actually need them for the whole day. Okay, so that, that would be for part-timers, right? Yes. Part -timers. So, yeah, so you might need more to run more service only at the peaks, and the peaks are not long enough. They're also not, they're also not spaced, they're kind of spaced eight hours apart, aren't they? So an eight-hour day doesn't really work to cover both peaks. So that's why you can do that by hiring part-timers or by extending the day to get 10 hours and cover both peaks. Okay, routing and scheduling. So uh, fixed, flexible, advanced booking, um, yeah, so uh, vehicle types, we have all these mini buses, articulated buses, rail cars, bi-level rail cars, low floor, we saw some examples. Control options, traditionally it was fixed block, but now we have moving block, and we have fancier systems, collisions, and to actually control the system to run faster, and uh, more even headway. And you have dual mode operations. So bus systems or light rail systems that work more like buses, but also more like rails in some segments. So in some cases, this dual mode has more to do with power. Um, so it could be a bus that runs electric in a tunnel section, but runs diesel out in a tunnel section, like the Silver Line here in Boston. Um, it could be having some sort of BRT system that operates on streets as a normal bus would, but then enters a, a corridor where it's fully dedicated to the bus system. So it's operating in both manners. Yeah. I'm not sure I follow can't hear you very well, but but the if you're asking about why not run diesel in the tunnel, it's for exhausts. 
yeah, so, so there might be regulations. Uh, you don't want diesel exhaust in the tunnels. So it's for health reasons. Um, a lot of the newer buses, like hybrid buses that are diesel electric, obviously if you get a fully electric bus, there's no issue. If you get a diesel electric, some of them have a hush. You're entering the tunnel, you can tell it to only use electric. Um, and it faster runs slower it will, but it'll, it'll run um, only on electric. And then get, you turn that off when you exit the station to keep generating electricity. Questions on these? Okay, rail versus bus. So rail has higher capacity. Um, bus has lower capital costs. It's cheaper to buy a bus than to buy uh, rail or to build rail. Uh, buses, you buy the vehicle and the streets are already there, so you're not, you don't, you're not having to build stations. Uh, the unit operating costs are lower for rail. So if you look at the average, uh, and we'll look at some of these costs, unit cost by, say, by trip, by passenger trip, um, because so many people ride rail, uh, it's cheaper per ride to, to provide rail than to provide bus. Uh, bus, however, can cover a wider part of the network because it's more flexible. Rail tends to have better service quality because it doesn't have traffic and it has a, a dedicated right of way. Um, uh, so, yeah. And it has a stronger land use influence because the stations are in a map and you, you sort of know the rail map of a city much faster than you learn about its bus network. Um, so there's a bias that people have towards taking rail over taking bus. Even if rationally taking bus would be faster, you may not even be aware of your, all, all of your bus options. Um, and uh, fewer negative externalities, that's because electricity that powers these is often generated outside of the city and brought in. So the po air pollution caused by the consumption of electricity for rail is not, uh, is not an externality that is, that is internalized in the city often, uh, if that makes sense. So, right, so bus is more, much more flexible and you can operate it on any road and or on a guided uh, right of way or a dedicated right of way. Um, and it's more prone to being used in full mode nature, right? Um, so just flexibility. Let's look at the, uh, going back to the APTA fact book of, of 2011, and these are numbers for 2000, because they always do these reports for two years before the report comes out. Um, so how much was spent in bus service in the US? Uh, so uh, 18, uh, this, is, this is in millions, so 18,000 million, 18 billion. Uh, heavy rail, less. Uh, and light rail even less, and then commuter rail is more expensive. Paratransit is uh, is a form of transit that is provided to handicapped people, and it's you you reserve it. You say I need to be picked up here and taken there, and you get a window, maybe a three-hour window, um, so they'll schedule a pickup and take you um, to provide service for you. Um, so because it's so dedicated, it, it's expensive to run. Okay, in terms of, that's, that's in terms of, uh, of operating expenses. How many trips are served? So bus also provides more than heavy rail because there are more bus systems all over the US. Heavy rail, but you can see if you compare the operating expenses with, with annual unlinked passenger trips, that it's more efficient per passenger, right? And then light rail and commuter rail and paratrans that are much smaller contributors to this. Let's go down to these uh, pale yellow ones. Here we are dividing operating expense by revenue vehicle hour or revenue vehicle mile or unlinked trip. So we get some unit costs, right? So you see the unit costs for a bus, uh, $3.40 per, per bus ride. Uh, for heavy rail, $1.80. For light rail, $3. Uh, for commuter rail, $10. And for paratransit, $26. So this is how much it costs to run that service when you divide it by the number of people taking it. Questions? Um, so like in London, the bus is like half the price of the tube, for example, at, at least uh, most of the time. So would that imply that either the buses in London are probably a lot cheaper than these or that they're subsidizing the bus trips because maybe less affluent people tend to take the bus versus the tube? Um, more the latter. 
Yeah. So yeah. The bus is ten to be more. I mean, it's it's cheaper to run one bus, but if you if you look at how many people can write a bus and how many people can write a train, um, yeah, the two on a unit cost basis uh, is yeah, it's more efficient. Um, the other thing is that you you put metro service in places where there is high demand, so it's somewhat cyclical, right? Um, bus service, you might have a mandate to cover a big area. So some of the bus quarters might be make, operating on profit, and some of them might be you're doing it because you have a mandate to provide service, and it's running, it's underutilized, and, and, and the price, that your cost per rider might be much higher. These are all operating costs, though, so just to keep it running. Yes, yes. No capital costs, and we're not talking about fares here. So this is how much it costs to pay the driver, the fuel, the maintenance. Yeah. Okay, let's look at uh, mean passenger load. I think this is interesting. So 10.7 for bus. So if you look at, if you take a bus uh, in, in the US at random, uh, the average number of people in it will be 11 people. Um, does that make sense? Is that your experience? It seems a little low. So one way of thinking about it, um, maybe I can clear the board a little bit here. I'm sorry it's very, yeah, they're all used up. One way of thinking about it is, uh, let's think of the AM peak. So, and let's just keep it very simple. So you have um, service going this way from one terminal to the other, let's say A and B, and service going back, right? And because this is the AM peak and this is the central business district, um, let's say that everybody's going in, nobody's coming out. So you have a lot of people boarding the bus closer to the city. Um, well, yeah, let's do it the other way, more realistically. People are boarding the bus, and as they get to the CBD, they alight, they get off at the city center, right? So, let's say that uh, a bus, this bus fits 45 people. So that's the peak right there. So what's the average in that direction? It's half of 45, right? Um, and then if you divide 45 by half and then by half because there's only one direction providing service, you have 45 by four, right? 45 by four is 11, so um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, just making sense of it, right? A quick check. There is another piece that a lot of us have taken buses in Boston, Chicago, and San Francisco where there are a lot of people taking buses in a lot of other cities. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and there's there's some of that in some of these other modes. So, heavy rail, um, for reasons, 25. This is per car, not per train. So, okay. Um, light rail, uh, also by car, although many light rail systems are single car or two car. So, uh, and then commuter rail is higher, 35.3. Um, two things. One is that you're mostly operating on the peak hour. So you're not providing much service off peak, therefore there's this uh, higher demand there. Uh, the other thing is that um, it, you have, right? So you, this, these cars are bigger. Uh, they, they have two decks sometimes and they fit more people. So that's why you have uh, higher mean passenger load. Okay, so just looking at some sort of averages nationwide and making some sense of them. Riderships by mode, an unlinked. Look, start with heavy. Other systems from from the from two classes ago, we saw that the oldest systems are the first ones to be built, and they're in cities that depend a lot on transit and use a lot of transit. So these five older systems, this was the ridership in 2009. If you look at seven newer systems built after that, that's the combined ridership, much lower, right? So you see the older systems 
are carrying a lot more people. And if you look at the change from 74 to 2009, only the old, it grew 63% in, in that time. Uh, with light rail, you have, uh, you start with seven old systems, uh, 188 uh, million, it grew by 26%. A lot of newer systems. You see that there are much more newer light rail systems, so there are newer heavy rail systems. Um, commuter rail, four old, 12 new, the same idea. The older, the older systems grew by 36%. Um, 12 new systems carried much less than the four old systems. So, and here's for bus, uh, we had, uh, yeah, 5.4 five, five billion, 5 billion uh, it grew by 10%. So that's just giving you an idea of how heavily the systems are being used. If you look at what has happened in, from 1999 to 2009, so one decade, a um, number of active vehicles, 10%. So the investment, the supply in heavy rail grew by 10%. The demand, or the, well, in this case, supply measured in another in, in another way, revenue vehicle miles operated, 20% or 19%. For light rail, we see that many more vehicles are are being and much more revenue miles are being operated. So again, more investment in light rail than in heavy rail. And yeah, commuter rail is somewhere in between. Uh, for bus, it's much less. It's, it looks like there is a higher level of investment in light rail systems than in other modes. Okay, and uh, service trends by mode. So we have here uh, boardings per revenue vehicle mile. So this is a way of measuring how much per supply. Uh, in 2009, this is how much 5.2 for heavy rail and light rail. Heavy rail grew by 16%, light rail decreased by 15%. Uh, again, more investment in light rail, but more of the growth happening in heavy rail. Um, commuter rail, same thing. Uh, some of this could be people, uh, more people moving towards cities and not requiring commuter rail. Um, or just suburbanization, people living in the suburbs and working in the suburbs for not having to take commuter rail. Uh, for loads, we see, again, loads increasing in heavy rail, uh, decreasing somewhat, or, or staying flat in other modes. So these are general trends. Um, okay, so last slide. Do you have any questions on these modes and their characteristics and the roles they play? And yes? Two questions. First of all, what exactly is revenue vehicle mile? And second of all, can you talk about why light rail being so much more operated on, but people aren't showing up. Why, why there's a change? Okay, so uh, revenue vehicle miles. Let's start with the first one. What is revenue vehicle mile? It, it's a measure of uh, the distance, total distance covered by an, a vehicle that is serving trips. So it excludes uh, deadheads from garages to the beginning of a route or, or any other vehicle movement where the vehicle is not serving people. It's not, it doesn't have a, its head sign on and uh, if it's a bust, right? So uh, that answers the first question. And the second one was why, why is there, why does there seem to be investment in light rail uh, when it seems like the, it's, the ridership is decreasing and the amount of, yeah, revenue vehicle miles are going down as well. So this, is more of a planning and politics question, I think. Um, cities and, and urban planners, because light, because rail has a, a more power to change the urban landscape, because it, in people's minds it is more, it's more physically present and permanent. Um, there is a preference towards rail systems over bus systems. Um, metro is appropriate for very large cities that a lot of them, a lot of those cities that require metro already have metro. So what we're seeing is that there's a lot of cities that are maybe not as big to require metro, but they could use a light rail system. They could also use BRT, but they have a bias towards light rail uh, in, in planning and, and for political reasons. Um, 
a politician might prefer to claim I built this train system, not I put some buses on, on the road, right? So these are real factors that influence um, the mode choice. The other thing is that a lot of these newer systems, because they are in smaller cities, they bring the average down. So. Yeah. Even if I could add on that, in the U.S., you would do light rail systems in Cincinnati and Tucson and Kansas City. But even if, but their increase in ridership, their, their their contribution to the increase in ridership of light rail might not even compensate for loss of ridership in other cities that have old systems like Philadelphia or Boston. Right. And so Philadelphia has a decrease. I'm not saying it did, but if it did, then it could wipe out the increase that Cincinnati contributed. Yeah, that goes both ways. These are averages. So, any other questions? Yes. Could be. So the question is, what commuter rail refers to in terms of the operator? Who operates commuter rail? And is that one of the characteristics uh, that, yeah. Um, I didn't include that here because there are many different arrangements for what commuter rail is and if it's publicly operated or privately operated uh, through a contract with the public sector. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of arrangements. Sometimes there's a separate agency that operates commuter rail. Um, and that's, it's not the same agency that operates the inner city bus and metro, so. Can you use the word So commuter rail is usually characterized by more service. The, the purpose of commuter rail is to bring workers into the city, right? So you have, um, you have a service that is a radial going into the city. Uh, the frequency of service is higher in the AM peak and the PM peak lower off peak, whereas intercity is more of a scheduled, intercity rail is more like airplanes and the airline industry, where you have a schedule and trains leave every hour or every two hours and you book in advance and, right? Um, so slightly different characteristics. Ari. Right. So a couple of questions. Um, well, I guess the, the first one is, if you go to pretty much any airport and they have an airport transit system, they have it's automated as platform train doors and all the like. And they've, we've been building those in the US since the 70s. Why are there, why is that never put forth except for in a couple of locations and I guess Vancouver and a couple of very small systems? Uh, I'll, that, the first and second ones aren't related. So is there any good reason for that? My guess is that uh, you have more space in airports and it's less political. You have, uh, you have a, you know, the stakeholder is the airport. The airport has funding streams to, for capital projects. Um, you have the space. You don't have to use eminent domain to, to you know, to uh, build a new system. If, if that's what you're talking about, if, if you're talking about building a new system, um, in terms of retrofitting an old system, well, that's harder than building a new one from the beginning, right? So, the investment required to you, the sh station shutdowns and all the headaches that you have to deal with if you're retrofitting a new system, putting in a new signaling, new signaling system, all these things. Uh, you might require a new fleet that is capable of, of operating this way. So it's a heavy lift um, to, to do the retrofitting. But it's being done. If you look at London, London's been doing it. They're, yeah, the, ju the Jubilee Line, which is the colored silver in, in the map of London, is operating uh, with, uh, with platform screen doors in the center at least. And also the full DLR system in London. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's, it's funny because that's Duckland's light railway, right? L is for light, but it's metro according to what we covered today. It's, it's heavy rail. Uh, and then the second question was, um, you look at something like Crosslink or RER or some of the S-Bahn lines, which are sort of hybrid commuter rail that then operate on trunks at very high frequency. Yeah. Do you have any, I don't know what the question is. Yeah, so again, we talked about stereotypes and the lines are blurry and I think it's useful to, the point of this is not to really categorize everything and be able to claim this is a heavy rail, this is a light rail. It's more as a framework to think about if you're a planner or a consultant and you're in charge of deciding or helping your city um, decide what mode to, to use for some project, here are the things you should think about. Here are the key decisions that you have to make. Station spacing, capacity, what are you dealing with? 
So that, in that sense, this context is, is this framework is useful, but I wouldn't go, I wouldn't use it to necessarily classify everything into one uh, with one label. Yeah. So these trends that you've shown are pretty much all in U.S. systems. Well, we have many pictures from internationally here. Yeah. You touched on this is Canada, uh, Mumbai. <laughs> right, so, okay. Yeah. But the trend. Oh yes, yes. Uh, ridership. That's right. Yes. That sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Is not quite the same outside of the US. Yeah, I'm not as knowledgeable on, on the trends uh, in Europe and Africa and Asia, uh, South America. Um, the I'm sure that other countries and the European Union uh, have uh, something similar in terms of reporting. Um, so. Yeah, I happen to know the fact book and the NTD statistics. I'm familiar with them, so I can go and refresh them and, and look at the unit costs. I'm sure you could do the same thing. I just haven't done it. It would be interesting to, to see how those trends have compared. With All right, if there are no more questions, class is dismissed. Uh, please meet with your teams and pick a day for data collection.